guess we'll just find out when it's over, like most weeks. Boy, you can tell Drew's back in the house, right? The singing was on fire this morning, guys. Appreciate that. Drew, I don't know if you ever even heard me preach live, have you? No. Only online, right? Yep, only online. Yeah, that's cool. So, I feel crushed up against this wall a little bit here. All right, we're in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 this week. Tell you, I learned a lot out of this chapter, man. I, one of the things I learned out of Corinthians 15 is, guys, if you want, if you do one of those read the Bible in a year plans, there's nothing wrong with that. But I learned out of this chapter that it's really not necessary. If you read three chapters, five chapters, guys, what's important is you're actually understanding what you're reading. Okay, I learned in this one chapter, man. There's enough topics in this to get fed for weeks. And you remember last week when Paul was covering the, the gifts and, and he was talking about speaking in unknown tongues? And what did he say? He said, it's better if I speak five words of my understanding than 10,000 in an unknown tongue or something, right? Well, the Bible, the chapters and the words on the page are the same thing, guys. You'd be better off reading one paragraph and studying it. Man, look up words. Run references. Find out what is being said here than you would to go and, and open up a book and read five chapters, speed read it, just to say, check box, I read those chapters, moving on. You, it just serves no real purpose, guys, if you're not understanding what it is you're reading. So today, we're only covering two chapters, but I tell you what, we're digging into them chapters. This is good stuff. The, the amount of topics Paul covers in this is unbelievable. He writes, 15.1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. All right, so what's it mean to stand? It means to, to be on a foundation. It means to, you can't be like overthrown. You can't be demolished, right? So right there, Paul's already preaching, right? You're on your foundation in the gospel, okay? Now, verse 2, I'm going to tell you. I, I love when God gives me, like, my own life testimony, and then he gives me revelation later, and so I can preach on it. Because I know there's people who, are, who this passage caused them a lot of trouble. And I'll show you why it caused me trouble. Paul writes, but, and notice, too, that one leaves off with the semicolon, meaning he's not done. He says, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And I remember going, oh no, we're back to conditional salvation, man. I don't know if I'm justified anymore, right? What if I get Alzheimer's when I get old? What if I get dementia? What if I don't keep in memory? Man, am I not saved anymore? This is a problem passage for me. Tony, I used to believe this. I'm like, there's a condition that if, man, what's going on with this if, right? And see, this is why Paul started it out saying, you stand, right? You're on your foundation, man. It's settled. So let's go back. Let's kick it back to the beginning of Corinthians 1. We're going to take you a little backwards trip through the Bible to, to show you what's going on with this passage. Remember, we preached uh, 118. And th this is where I did a little King James Bible rant. And rightfully so, because the King James Bible says, for the preaching of the cross, none of the other top ten Bibles use preaching there. They say either message or word, right? And preaching is important. You find that out later in this chapter, that it's preaching that saves. He says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are what? Saved. Which are saved, correct. It is the power of God. All the other top ten Bibles say you're being... You're not saved anymore. You're in the act of, which means you're not, right? My Bible says, ye are saved. All right, so that's settled, right? Well, preacher, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm doubting it lately. All right, kick her back to Romans. Go to Romans 3. Paul's preaching the gospel. Let's make sure we know what he's talking about. 3.24, Paul writes, being justified, what? Freely. So, do you have to work for it? No. no. no free is free, right? Yep. 
It says, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, and I always define that as like an atoning sacrifice. And uh, if, if you want to get deep on it, it's an atoning sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath. You find that out in Romans 1, that his wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. He says, set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And I believe there's some Bibles that remove the blood there. That's kind of not good, right? <laughs> to declare whose righteousness? It's his. For the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, Paul writes, to declare, right? You're getting a declaration here. I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him, which what? Which believeth. Which believeth in Jesus. So there's your gospel, guys. It's settled. It's all about that, that work of faith. It's faith in Christ and his blood. Now, back to Corinthians 15. So, I finally figured out what's going on with this passage. It has to do with this word, unless she believed in vain. You look into this word vain, it, it can mean a few things, but it will give you an illustration and a picture. It can mean empty, worthless, fruitless, ineffectual, having no substance, value, or importance. So now you're getting a picture of what Paul's really saying. By which also ye are saved, guys. But he says, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed ineffectually, unless your belief is going to have no substance, it's going to have no value. So what he really means is, it's the stuff that Paul is, is writing to you to build you up into the faith. The saved is settled, guys. We we. We're past that now. I have to preach this a lot, but I remember a time I put every scripture through the lens of justification. You know, every word, I'm like, is he talking about saved or unsaved? Paul settled that. He's moved on to stuff, guys. He wasted a whole lot of paper and ink if that isn't already settled back in Romans 5. He's trying to now build you up into the faith. He's trying to get you walking worthy of this calling wherewith we've been called. So that's, it's all hinging upon that vanity. If you don't keep in memory what Paul preached, your belief is going to be in vain. It's going to have no value. It's ineffectual. All right? He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He writes, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, that according to the Scriptures is important. A lot of times... We talk about in uh, the fellowship of like, if you only had five minutes, if you knew a, a lost man was dying, you only had five minutes to, to get him saved. A lot of people go to this, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, and say, if, if you can get him to believe that, the man's saved. You know, it's like, uh, it's life-saving information, and, and we're just trying to get it understandable and easy to where they get presented the gospel and then they either believe it or they don't. And if they believe it, they're sealed unto the day of redemption. We find that out in Ephesians. He says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. That means that they've passed away. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Now, Paul was the last person to see Christ. A lot of people think when, you, when you're reading through the Gospels, you know, and you're reading through the red letters, and Christ gets hung on a cross, and he says it is finished, that, that that's like the end of his ministry. But that's not the end of Christ's ministry. When he ascended back to heaven, he gave revelation to Paul. Do you remember in the last chapter we covered 1437? He says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are commandments. There you go. You've been reading your Bibles. Praise the Lord. The commandments of the Lord. So Christ was still giving commandments from heaven to Paul. And, and you're like, oh, 
Oh, no, preacher. We back under the law. We got new commandments. It's not commandments in according to the law of Moses. Consider these commandments of faith. These are commandments of, of walking worthy of our calling, guys. They're still commandments, and it's not a list of ordinances. If you break one, you're going to hell. That's already settled. Guys, you don't... Your earthly father give you commandments all the time. Dude, this is you and do them, right? You know? <laughs> Same thing with God. He's telling you, I'm commanding you to do this. But it's on you if you do it or not. The, the, the heaven or hell is settled, guys. If you're a believer, that's all you got to do is believe in Christ's blood. And we're moving on. But God has given us a list of commandments to keep. And it's for our admonition. It's for our learning. It's good for us. Yeah. But it's on you if you want to listen to him or not. He says, get this, as of one born out of due time. You know that word born is to be like produced or to be brought to life. Think of, of where you were in your walk before the gospel, how lost you were, how dead you were. That gospel brought you to life, didn't it? Paul was born out of due time. And I thought of a, a verse in Galatians 1, if you want to flip forward a few chapters of past Corinthians. Paul writes in verse 15, he says, When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb. Well, that's being born, right? He said, and called me by his grace. Y'all have been called by his grace as well. If you don't know that, you do now. Why? Why was he called? Verse 16, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Guys, that's the purpose. That's, that's why Paul was born out of this due time. It was to reveal God's Son in Paul. Did you know Christ is, is living inside you? You're a living temple. You have the Son of God in you, man. You should start looking in that mirror a, a little differently. You know, stop, stop always staring at your sin and th feeling so worthless all the time. Yeah. You have the Son of the living God dwelling inside of you. Man. That'll straighten your walk up a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. Amen. That's the purpose that Paul was called here. And look how humble he is, verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. Man, I almost brought it to you in my eye. Because I persecuted the church of God. You know, I never slayed anyone, but I feel like I was a persecutor of the church as well. I used to... I used to join like atheist versus Christian debate groups. I would stand in my kitchen and I would pose questions to my mom and sister and then just cut them down, knowing their answers before I even asked them, just so I could tear their faith down, man. That's a persecutor of the church. I didn't do it with sword, but I did it with words, and words cut just the same. He writes, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. See, that grace was not ineffectual. That grace has value. It has importance, y'all. He says, but I labored more abundantly than they all. And it's like, well, he's getting a little prideful. He says, no, yet not I. It's not Paul, guys. But what? The grace of God, which was with me. Isn't that beautiful, man? You think about it, you're, you're not out there laboring for yourself, guys. It's that grace of God in you that's actually laboring. He says, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach. And so ye believe. Can't believe without hearing the word, right? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Amen. We need preachers, y'all. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. Well, we got some false teachers going on here, Paul's correcting. He says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is, then is Christ not risen? He says, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be, that the dead rise not. Look what he says here. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. That's a problem, guys. If you, if you don't believe in the risen Christ, you're still in your sins. 
Man, you know, it's the death of Christ. We're buried with Him, but we're also raised with Him in newness of life. Yes, That's how we walk in newness of spirit, man. The resurrection is just as important. He says, uh, I'm sorry, then, verse 18, they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. He's talking about the people who have died. He says, if, basically, if Christ is not right, everybody has died. They're gone. They're perished, man. Verse 19, he says, in this life only, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most Miserable. You know what he means by that? Misery without any kind of hope, guys. He's going to double down on this thought later. Yeah. He says, but now. Man, every time I read but now, dude, it's there's always something awesome coming, right? But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He says, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I heard somebody say one time, the Bible is really just a book about two men, Adam and Christ. And there's like a little bit of truth to that, right? There's a lot more going on, obviously. But notice, Adam and Christ get compared a lot. Yeah. In fact, Christ is even referred to as the last Adam. All right, now we're starting to, we're going to get deep, guys. He says, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So this is the second coming of Christ here, but it's even deeper than that. It says, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And you remember that time we covered some of this, the bruising Satan under your feet. He says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Verse 27, For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now that word subdued, guys, it's, it's a powerful word. It means to conquer something by force, and reduce it to subjection. Did you know that was actually Adam's job? Did you know that? Adam's job was to subdue, and he, he didn't do his job, man. Adam got fired. Go to Genesis 1. Check it out. Let's see it, preacher. I don't believe you. <laughs> Show you on the page. Genesis 1. Way back in the beginning. Let's wait for everyone. I want you to know that I don't make false statements when it comes to Scripture. I'd rather stand up here in silence and say something wrong, right? I don't ever want to be a preacher who just talks off the hip and then, oopsie, got to recant that next week. You know, I don't want to do that. So, <laughs> chapter one, I, you know what I mean? I don't want to be a false teacher, guys. That's why I also ain't giving... Uh, a whole bunch of messages every week. I'm just putting a lot of time into this book to give you one good one, and that's just where I'm at in my walk right now. Uh, verse 28. All right, we'll go 27. So God created man in his own image, right? You've all heard this. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and what? Subdue it. That was their job, guys. They were told to subdue the earth. They didn't do that. They fell, right? They fell into disobedience to God. And so Christ was tasked with subduing the earth. I was talking to a brother the other day and I said, you know, 
can you imagine right you're raised up and you're a little one and you're living your life and your parents are raising you and at some point right you come into adulthood well the world says 18 we'll say 19 20 21 we'll give you all the way to 22 okay you're now 22 years old you're an adult and I say brother all right now I need you to subdue the whole earth and reconcile man back to God where do you start yeah. You know? Where do you start? I'm saying uh, resigning right away. Too much pressure. Can't handle it. You know, that's Christ's not only job, but he actually completed it. Yes, sir. He did it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he hasn't finished the subduing part. That's his coming. That's prophecy. But he has reconciled man back to God through his yeah. blood. Thank you, Lord. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Man, I love that. So... Now, if you're going to understand this passage, you do need to understand that not only is this Christ at his second coming, this is actually talking about the complete fullness of times when everything gets sub subdued back to God. And so to understand the fullness of times, you have to understand that God has uh, two different plans and purpose for times. He has a plan and purpose for his nation of Israel. And he has a plan and purpose for the body of Christ. Now, this is a very deep study. We could spend weeks on this, but just for the sake of getting through this, I got two passages for you. Go to Acts 2. We're going to discuss what, what he's doing with Israel first. Now, remember what he promised Abraham, right? He said, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Right? Israel was given a promise of an inheritance, an earthly inheritance of land and all that. Guys, that's why they're still over fighting over that stuff, man. It's not settled yet. Prophecy is not completed yet, and that's why the world's still in the state it is and things are still going on. But when God makes a promise, He's going to see it through. You can guarantee Israel's going to get exactly what God promised to them. All right, so let me double check real quick. Chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 29. 29. He says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Y'all know about David, right? The king. That he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit where? On his throne. On his throne, guys. That's an actual physical account of what's going to happen. The Bible is a literal book. Christ is going to literally sit on the throne of David Amen. and rule that nation for a thousand years. That's going to happen. Okay. Now, Let's go to Ephesians 1. Now you can see what God's doing today with the body of Christ. See, the reason that, that prophecy wasn't revealed what God was doing with the body of Christ, it says because had, had the princes of the, of the world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. We cover this all the time, right? There's a purpose behind it. So when people explain that... Um, that the church has become Israel, that, that's not the actual case. They're still Israel. Their prophecy is just as valid today as it always was. Amen. And there's also the body of Christ. Okay, so Ephesians 1, i got to get there myself. <laughs> Start talking. Ephesians 1. This is going to lead into my next point. 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, where? In heavenly places in Christ. Amen. Now that's a heavenly place, right? That's not earthly, correct? Yeah. Right. Okay. So look over at chapter 2. He says, uh, well, we'll start at verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And I always love to define that quickened man. It means to make you alive again. That's beautiful. Hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved, right? Are. Amen. Guys, it's settled. 
and hath raised us up together and made us sit together where? In heavenly, places. heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the body of Christ has a heavenly calling. Now, the, the Bible doesn't make that fully clear exactly what we're going to be doing up there, but I know we're going up there for certain. Amen. Okay, so we won't speculate. So now, we've covered that. Israel's getting land and King Jesus, and we're going up to do something. I'm not exactly sure, but two purposes. Now, notice that, uh, okay, we got to go to the next one. Actually, stay in Ephesians. I'm sorry. Ephesians 1. Let's go to verse 7. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us. Now get this. In all wisdom, God wants you to be wise, y'all, and this is what this book's for. Amen. And prudence. Do you know what prudence is? The easiest way I can define it for you, it's wisdom applied to actually doing something, like in your practice. Okay? So he don't want you to just know, he also wants you to know and do. Amen. So he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. So guys, if you don't know his will, it's not his fault. And you know what I mean? He made it known. Amen. So if you don't know it, it's on you. It says, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation, now get this, of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. You get that? So at some point, that plan and purpose of the, the earthly calling of Israel and the heavenly calling of the body of Christ, it's still going to all be reconciled into one in Christ. Because we're still in what we call times right now. All right, so you got that. Now look at... Uh, Colossians 1, and you're going to see how this stuff lines up. I love this stuff so much, guys. I, I'm so thankful for this blessed King James Bible, man. I don't know where I'd be without it. In Colossians 1, verse 9, we're going to read a few passages here. Sometimes I start back just because it's beautiful. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom, you see how it's lining up, and spiritual understanding, right? Not just head knowledge. Paul wants your spirit to get edified as well. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, that's what we're trying to do every Sunday, guys. We're trying to increase in this knowledge of God, me included. Strengthen with all might, according to His glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. Paul preaching to me. I need to work on that one. Thank you, Paul. Giving thanks unto the Father, which He hath made us meet to be partakers of, of the inheritance of the saints in light. Did you know you have an inheritance? Yes. Man, I'm thankful for that. I, I'm pretty poor down here, but it don't matter. I got an inheritance. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm thankful. Amen. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Amen. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Do you think Paul wants us to know we have redemption? He covered it a couple times, right? Yeah. Because he knows we're going to keep forgetting it, right? Yeah. Just got to settle it in your mind over and over and over. Guys, you're forgiven. Guys, you have redemption. Saved by his blood. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Are you getting a, an idea of what's going on here, guys? He, he kind of important. Yeah. Just yeah. about nothing else really matters, actually. Yeah. It's yeah. all for him, by him. 
verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, that's us, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, which if you look it up, it means like you're first in everything, man, superior to all. Yeah. That makes sense. Amen. It says, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven you see that Amen. there is your completion of what God's doing with the fullness of times right now man's in a fallen state even the things in heaven are in a fallen state. It actually says that the stars are not pure in his sight. I don't know where that is, but it's absolutely in your Bible. So the, the creation is, is, is trying to get completely reconciled back to God. All right, that is what God's doing with time. And you need to understand time to understand what your walk is, what your calling is. You're in time, right? When Paul writes, when he says redeeming the time because the days are evil? How on earth are you going to redeem time if you don't even understand what God's doing with time? You know what I mean? Yeah. How are you going to redeem your time? You don't know what He's doing with time. So, okay. Paul writes. So now you get that. You get the second coming. You get the fullness of time. This is what I mean. Chapter 15 is buck wild, man. The, the topics Paul's covering here and now he's going to go back into what he started with verse 12. He said, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I had to ask this question because almost every time Paul uses a question to make a point, it goes over my head. He's basically saying, If Christ is not raised, what are we doing here, guys? We're out here preaching, risking our lives. Paul's been stoned, all this craziness. He says, if Christ is not reigned, what are we doing? We're wasting our time. He says, I protest, which actually in this context, I thought it meant get this picket signs, you know, hey, oh, protesting. No, it's not what it actually means. It means to make a declaration or to like to give evidence of something. He says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die daily. Paul was living a rough life back then. He says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Right? What am I doing, guys? He's making a great point. He says, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He's basically saying, If Christ is not raised from the dead, just live your life. Party it up, y'all. That's the point he's making. None of this matters. Just eat and drink. We're going to die. Who cares? And now he says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I can't believe how many times in my life I've ripped Bible verses out of their context and used them to make some human point. I used to preach this, so I used to be very addicted to video games. Uh, in particular, violent video games where you would like run around with a team with guns and kill each other. And in these games... Often you'd wear headsets. And I tell you what, the stuff you hear in these little kids when they're screaming in their microphones, it's unbelievable, guys. It would knock you out of your seat. And I remember like preaching to people this verse. I'd be like, you gotta get out of them game lobbies, y'all. Evil communications, corrupt good manners. And yeah, but that's not at all the point Paul's making here. This point Paul's making here goes all the way back to 12 when he said, How say some among you there is no resurrection from the dead? The evil communication is false teachers. It's bad preaching. He's talking to the church, man. He ain't talking to the lost world. Amen. That's deep. You cannot rip a, a verse out of its context and apply it anywhere you want, man. This, these things have meaning. And now he says, awake to righteousness and sin not for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Whoa, Paul's fired up. He's not happy about this, man, because this is tearing people's faith down, right? Could you imagine if you woke up one day and you stopped believing Christ is raised from the dead? 
I can't imagine what that would do to my life. I just can't even imagine. That's why he's speaking in their shame. These people are getting corrupted by some bad doctrine. And you guys on Facebook, man, I'm preaching on Facebook right now, but you should really talk less and listen more. I mean, you're, we're all going to be at the judgment seat, guys, and have to hold an account. And like some of the stuff we say that we just shoot off from the hip and, and wish we had it back. I mean, I did it for a long time. I am ashamed of a lot of the things I did in my early walk in Christ. When I used to go out with these, I, I met these two young boys. They were the most zealous I'd ever seen. And I'm like, I, I appreciate that. You know, you don't see that today. So many people are so lukewarm, you don't even know they're Christian, right? Yeah. They're afraid to talk about Christ. I met these young, zealous boys at a time in my life when, when I was basically a law-keeping legalist. I didn't know that at the time, but I was. And we would go street preaching. And sometimes somebody would ride by on a bike. And so you think in your head, I only have like five seconds. And I would just read, repent or perish. And I thought, I'm serving God, man. I was like, yes. What a terrible witness, y'all. That's not the gospel. Guess what I was doing? I was ministering death, man. There is no life in those words. That's not what the gospel is. I'm ashamed of that stuff. Apply that online. I've done those very same things in my early online ministry. Post passages like, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. What's the matter with you, bro? You got an evil heart, man. But, but deceived, right? Not according to knowledge. I believed I was serving the Lord. I believed I was keeping people out of hell. I knew I was headed to hell, or I thought so. I didn't even know what the gospel was myself. I thought I was heading to hell, and if I kept, if I diverted enough people out of the fires myself, maybe God would have mercy on me. That was my own plan of salvation. Boy, can you find chapter and verse of any of that in here? No, you can't, man. That, they call that relying on thy own understanding, right? And that is a large portion of of the church right now, man. They just they're going off feelings and emotions and I think and I feel man, you gotta put it to the book. Test yeah. every spirit. Amen. You know, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You know what that means? It's subject to this book. You don't get to just make it up as you go or go off your feelings and emotions. Your feelings and emotions will deceive you. Yeah. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Well, I'm just following my heart, preacher. Well, that's terrifying. <laughs> you're in a world of mess if you're doing that. <laughs> Man. All right, so I went on a little rant there. Back, to, back on point. He says, verse 35, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Ain't that man's reasoning to like try and reason you out of the Bible and the truth? Yeah. Always posing questions. He says, Thou fool, that which thou soweth is not quick and accept it, die. Think of your own body. You ain't made alive again unless you died with Christ. Yes, he's a, that's what he's point he's making. And now he's going to use a real world example. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. And every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one. Now get this. And the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. And another glory of the stars, get this, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So the stars don't have a, a communion, well they have a communion glory, but they're also differing in glories from one star to another. Guys, God gives different glory to different things. Now we have a glory in the body of Christ to be saved. You are perfect in Jesus in that sense. But I'm going to present to you, I believe that at the judgment seat, we're going to receive different glories. It's a biblical concept. 
Before we get into that, I want to show you something I found with my daughters this week. This is cool. Go to Genesis 1 again. They were asking me about this stuff. They're really interested in the Genesis account of creation. You know, we call it biblical cosmology. And I found this, and I kind of like fell out of my seat because I said I've never seen this before. I've never heard anyone preach on this before. I've never heard it discussed, period. And I want to show it to you. Genesis 1. We'll start at 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. And this ain't preaching on the firmament right now. That's for another time. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Okay. So in this verse, we get lights. That's all we're told. They're just lights. But they do have purposes. Signs, seasons, days, and years. And we can determine that's some kind of like time piece, right? It's like God's watch, we'll call it. So there's lights in the firmament that's for God's watch. You with me so far? Yes. All right, he says, next verse. And let them be four lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And so they have another purpose to give light upon the earth. And when you read that, like, it was so, that God kind of, like, wrapping up this thought, you know? We're moving on, basically. Right. He says, and God made two great lights. Now, get this. So, now we have, we have lights, and now we have two great lights. These have been set apart. And the greater lights to rule the day. Now, you get some kind of authority. Rule means to, you have been given authority. You're ruling. So, notice in 14, these lights, they have no role or authority. They're just lights, correct? They have a purpose, but they're just lights. All right, stay with me. So, he says, two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Now, he says, he made the stars also. Guys, the lights aren't the stars. Right here, he wrapped up the lights and it was given no rule. What do you mean, preacher? Look, keep reading. And God set them, what? The stars, right? In the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and saw God saw that it was good. So these stars are also given the task of giving light upon the earth, but they have rule. The stars have rule. The regular lights did not have rule. So I'm proposing this, that the stars are some kind of light, but they're given some kind of authority. But not every light in the sky is a star. Do you see it? I think it's there, guys. I've never heard anyone present this or talk about it, but I'm pretty sure that's what, what's been going on here. The lights, the regular lights were not given role. They were giving a purpose, right? The timepiece thing. So I don't know. I mean, I, from that point on, I'd have to start speculating, and I won't do that. You look at it for yourself, but that's mind-blowing, right? Yeah. This is what I'm talking about when I said you don't need to read 10 chapters of the Bible to feel like you serve God. Read one, understand it, and go seek it out, man. Go look at different gloryings and, you know, run references, all that stuff. You're going to get fed that way. Now, back to the differing in glories. Go to 2 Corinthians. We cover this a lot, too. And guys, this kind of passage, it's, I don't want it to scare you, right? I want it to actually edify you, and I want it to, to you to understand who you are and what your purpose is. 2 Corinthians 5.10. But a lot of people will read this and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> Paul writes, I'll let them help get there. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But not me, preacher. I'm, I'm not going, right? Not all means all, y'all. We're all going to appear at this. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we will, guys, even saved, justified believers in Christ, will still be presented and give an account. Okay? You with me? Look what he says next. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But now wait a second. Paul knows he's a justified, saved believer. 
but he still says there's a terror of God and that knowledge he's persuading men hey get get right get right with God that's what he's persuading right we'll look at another one Colossians 1 we cover this all the time we can use the Bible to make all our points but we can also use reasoning with you I'm a very critical like logical thinker Colossians 1 we're going to start with verse uh, we'll go with 25 Paul writes where have I made a minister so Paul's a minister according to what according to the dispensation of God which is given me to given to me for you to fulfill the word of God this is one of the purposes of God or of Paul's ministry is to fulfill the word of God he says even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations why was it hid preacher do you know Yes, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If this, if what Paul's writing about here was in prophecy, the devil wouldn't have killed Christ. It's that simple. He says, But now is made manifest to his saints, so it's not a mystery anymore, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. There's the mystery, guys. The devil didn't know about the body of Christ. He did not know that we would be in Christ and Christ would be in us. He didn't know it. And now look what he says. Whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So guys, if it was only yes or no, justified or not justified, saved or unsaved, what's he warning because he's talking to the church here. Christ in you is somebody saved with the Spirit of God in them. So what's he warning them about? Think about it. There's more to this thing. I, I have a concept I call it. When, you, when you're lost, you're lost, right? But when you hear the gospel and you believe it, you're sealed under the day of redemption. I call that a day one Christian. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. You should drop to your knees and cry. But what are we doing with day two, y'all? What's next, man? This is what Paul's warning about. This judgment seat of Christ that we're going to be presented before God. And what I believe is a, a day two Christian is when you need to start learning and having yourself conform to the image of God's Son. And yes, guys, it's, it's a journey and there's peaks and valleys in this thing. But the more we get Christ formed in us, the less shame we have and, and the more that that's going to remain. That is when Paul writes about life everlasting. The, the Christ working in you is life everlasting. The more you know this book, you know when you look around in your life or you're out shopping, everything you see and everyone you see is going to burn up. It's all gone. The, this word lasts forever. This is the only thing in this entire world that lasts forever. You know, it's one of the only things I will go broke a thousand times over buying people Bibles. I love doing it. I love going broke buying people's Bibles. Why? Because money is so shallow, y'all. And it's the one thing I can use my money for to purchase someone eternal life. How cool is that? That should give you a fire to go hand out Bibles and spend your paychecks on them, man. You can buy them a house and buy them a car. Guess what? House going to rot car going to rust yeah. what'd you do for them Come on. not much yeah. you know this book does something for them both in this life and in the life to come Amen. all right let's go back to you y'all well we're getting on a preaching rant today huh oh, no. i don't even have notes y'all i just have references and we're just going off Bless the spirit him, today Bless him. amen all right so you got that. You got the differing glories. Mm -hmm. For 42, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. What he means there is your body's corrupt. It's deceitful according to the lust. And it's got to it's gotta be sown. It's got to be, it's got to die. It's got to be for your spirit to be quickened. And you're going to be raised in this incorruption, in this spirit. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So that's what I was talking about when Christ is referred to as the last Adam. Bob's a book about two men, two Adams, really. It's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. But no, it's way deeper than that. But how bet that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. Amen. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. He says, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And notice the born there has an extra E, which it really just means to bear as well. So as we bear this, this earthy image, we shall also bear this heavenly. Now this, I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now look what he says. Behold, I shew you a mystery. Now, I want to present something to you. This, Paul, it's about to get into, is what the church knows as the rapture. Now, I know the word itself, rapture, is not in the Bible, but we're just going to use it as a placeholder to give you an image of what we're talking about. Now, is something that is prophesied and spoken of also something that's a mystery? No. Can't be, correct? Correct. So what Paul is covering in verse 15, 23, and 28 cannot be the same thing he's about to show you now, right? Yeah. Right. He said, he's basically saying... I'm making, a, I'm making a right turn here. We're about to cover something we ain't covered before. Yeah. Okay. He says, We shall not all sleep. And sleep in this context is die. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. You know, the twinkling of an eye. I looked up. I don't know why. I was just like twinkling. I want to look that up. It's like the. The space of time between a blink, man. Just boom, done, instant. Like that's deep. It's just in a moment, in a boom, just instantaneously at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Amen. 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 Guys, you know I didn't even believe in the rapture until recently. And I, and I love this. This is another one of those points where I get to use my real life to teach what I used to teach, what I used to believe, and what I know and am persuaded of the Lord Jesus Christ now. First, I'll just show you what I used to teach and what I used to understand. Let's go to Matthew 24. Because for me, it was very simple. I was like, well, the Lord's our Savior, right? And so we just always go to the red letters and whatever he said, that, that's fine. And that's very human reasoning, right? Makes sense. And look, not only did I preach this, I, I would only listen to preachers who preach this. Okay, in Matthew 24, let's, I'm going to give you like an overview. Um, let's start at verse 3. It's written, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him, privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, do you see that? They're actually asking about what we covered. The second coming and the end of the world, the end of times, the fullness of times. So, signs. They're looking for signs, okay? That's the question posed to Christ. 
And you've all, mostly, if you've been in church for any time, you've heard sermons on this stuff. Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name. You've heard us. We're not going to cover all that, okay? We're going to go all the way to verse 29. This is usually like the, mm, the final point that people that preach Matthew 24 make. He says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, now get this, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign, now get this, that's a sign, right? Keep that in your mind, of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of what? Okay, so now get this. These angels are given this trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so I used to preach, guys, don't you read your Bible? Matthew 24, Christ said, immediately after tribulation, he coming, right? I would say, how is there even an, any argument at all? This is ridiculous. It's so settled and easy. I don't know what you guys are even talking about. Okay. Used to preach this, right? I also used to preach this when I didn't study my Bible. So, so let's study this guy out a little bit. Now let's go to Revelation. Because... There's a lot going on to this stuff, guys. And you're going to see it, and I love to teach it to you. Revelation 6, we'll start there. Okay, I'm going to give you another overview because we don't have time to cover all of this stuff. But I'll start 6 1. It is written, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. So the Lamb <laughs> kicks this thing off, right? The seals get opened by the Lamb. So in chapter 6, you have the opening of the first seal. Verse 3, you have the opening of the second seal. Uh, verse 5, you have the opening of the third seal. Chapter 6, verse 7, you have the opening of the fourth seal. Verse 9, you have the opening of the fifth seal. And in verse 12, he says, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now that's exactly what Christ said, ain't it? Yeah. So he's talking about this same event. Okay? You with me so far? Yes. Now look. Look at verse uh, 17 of what's actually going on here. For the great day of his wrath is come. Get this. And who shall be able to stand? That's a scary day. Would you agree? Yeah. Who means everyone, all of us. Who's going to stand in this day? God's wrath is come. Okay? Are you with me? Yeah. Now, chapter 7. Chapter 7, we'll give you over to two. You can read this for yourself in your free time. But it's basically, there's angels that have power to hurt the earth, but they can't do it until there's the sealing of the 144,000. You've probably heard of that before in church. Okay? And then verse 9 starts to give you the idea of this great multitude that, uh, that are in white robes. Now look at 7. Um, let's look at 7.13. It says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence come they? Like, basically, who are these people, and how did they get here? Verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of, the great, tri of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and, in, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so you have this, these people. They're coming out of great tribulation, now notice, the only, only the first six seals have been opened, right? Yeah. So, in a way, technically, this great tribulation is tied to the first six seals. It just is, because look, look at chapter 8, how it starts. And when he had opened the seventh seal, 
There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And guys, I've studied this. Half an hour, I don't believe, means a human, like, worldly half an hour. It actually means 21 months. I don't have time to go in all that, but you can run the reference in Revelation 13, 5. It, it breaks it down of what an hour is. It's 42 months. And so half an hour, 21, makes sense, right? He says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven what? Trumpets. Okay. So in the Matthew account, who has the trumpets? Seven angels. The angels. And in the Revelation account, who has the trumpets? Seven angels. The angels, right? You with me so far? Yes. And this is what I used to preach, man. Christ said immediately after... So we're going to be here, man. And door to the end, church, right? Boy, I used to get pumped up, fired up for that, man. Now that I actually read my Bible, I don't want any part of what's going down in the book of Revelation. And I'm going to show you, praise the Lord, we're not going to be here for it. Amen. Look what Paul says now. Behold, I show you a mystery back in Corinthians. We're in Corinthians chapter 15, if I lost you. Verse 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So it really has to do with looking into this trump, guys. Now, I want to take you to First Thessalonians. That's why I had you sit by her, Mom. I told you we were flipping today. First Thessalonians, you got, uh, it's after Colossians. This is what's going to drive it home for you. To, to show you that, that what Paul was covering with Christ's second coming in the fullness of times cannot be the same event of this mystery he's showing us. This is something new. This was not prophesied. In chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this was actually the, the purpose of, one of the main purposes of this epistle to the Thessalonian church was to correct them on this. They were, they were a little mixed up. He says, but I would, verse 13, 413, but I would not have you be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep. Remember? He basically means which have died. I don't want you ignorant regarding those who died. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. So what's he saying there? You got hope, right? Okay. He says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He says, For this we say unto you by what? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. So this ain't Paul just giving his best advice, right? right? This is by the word of the Lord. Remember I said Christ was still giving revelation and commandment to Paul. This is word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For, now get this, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Who had the trumpets in Matthew and Revelation? Who has the trumpet here? This is the Lord Himself. One's angels, one's the Lord Himself. Can those be the same event? No. 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 That is the trump of God. He says, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with Lord. Amen. Amen. So there's the rapturing of the church. God, how cool is that? See, when he comes to bring his wrath, he sends his angels to get the thing popped off. When God comes to get his church, he comes himself. Amen. How beautiful is that, man? He coming down himself. Hey, Jesus, can I hit your ride, brother? Yeah. Man, I'm ready to get out of here, y'all. Yeah. Now look, look what he says in verse 5. This is why I pointed out in Matthew, they were asking for signs, right? It said, what are the signs in the end of the world? Paul writes in chapter 5, but of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need. 
that I write unto you. Why don't they have a need, guys? Why don't they need to know the times and seasons? They don't. They're not here for it. It doesn't apply to them. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Don't worry about it, y'all. Look what he says. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, that's the scary wrath day, so cometh as a thief in the night. He says, For when they shall have peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. He says, As trapel upon a woman with, a ch with child, and they shall not escape. Now you see what he meant by like, Who shall stand? Now get what he says in verse 4. But ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Guys, you see it. That day can't overtake you. You're not in darkness, guys. You should know this, that you don't actually have any reason to stare. I remember in 2016, maybe 2017, I was big into the conspiracy stuff back then, okay? Tons and tons of research of just filling up my mind with darkness and it was really destructive. And there was something that they called the Revelation 12 sign, some astrological sign that was supposed to happen. And I literally thought things were popping off. I was shouting, the end of the world is nigh, everybody. <laughs> How many years ago was that? Four, five, six years ago? Boy, I looked a little silly, huh? If only I had known that of the times and seasons I have no need, right? I wouldn't have got so freaked out. <laughs> you know what I mean? How many blood moons are, is the Christian community going to be like, this is it, boys, it's the big one, you know? <laughs> and it never does anything, does it? No. Now we know why, right? Church still here. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, right? You know, the whole epistle of Thessalonians, it's one of the main things. Go to chapter 1. I want to show you this. Paul mentions this rapture, the coming of the Lord, in every chapter. Look at chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for who? His son. His son from heaven. You see it? Okay. There's the coming of the Lord, right? Uh, 2, let me find it. Uh, 2, 19. For what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at what? His coming. His coming. Mentioned it again now, didn't he? Look at chapter 3, verse 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the what? coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. He mentioned it again. Boy, you're starting to think Paul wants you to know about this? Yeah. We just covered four, and now let's look at uh, chapter five. Look at verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Pretty awesome, right, guys? Man, we don't. That's what I'm saying. If we just hone in on the things we're reading, boy, you can really get fed from it. Yeah. All right. So that is what we call. Now you see why I'm like chapter 15 is nuts. You got the gospel. You got the second coming. You got the fullness of times. You got the rapture, all in one chapter. Wow. All right. He says, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I sadly have to remind myself that sometimes, guys. I really do. I'm, I'm going to confess. Sometimes I get weary and well-doing. But our work is never in vain in the Amen. Lord. And guys, I wanna, I wanna make a point too. Of uh, go to Romans 16. Now you're gonna see. This is why I started like my series in Romans. It's to establish you, and it also is gonna show you why it's so important to know what you're preaching and what you're looking at. This is all of a sudden gonna make sense if it never did before. 
In chapter 16 and verse 25, Paul writes, Now to him that is of power to establish you, according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets. So Paul just told you right there, there is two preachings of Jesus Christ. There is preaching of Christ according to the mystery, and there's a preaching of Christ according to the scriptures. We just covered it right there, guys. The preaching of Christ according to the scriptures is his second coming. It's the fullness of times. The preaching of Christ according to the mystery that was kept secret is what he's doing with the church today and our rapturing out of here. Yeah. Now, have you ever heard of 2 Timothy 2.15? Study to shew thyself approved unto God. He says, A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you see it? Yeah. There is a, a need to know what you're looking at and rightly dividing the word, guys. If you don't, you just if you just apply every verse to you, you ain't going to have that hope to get raptured out of the church. You're going to think you're standing there in the second coming. Who is able to stand, right? Boy, that's scary. Yeah. You're not going to understand when Paul writes things like, you have no need that I write, that, that you're divided out of that wrath of God. That's not for the church. We're his body, the fullness of him. So there you go. There's, I've seen preachers who, who butcher right division, but they use that verse, and it's like, well, what are you right dividing? You know, are you just dividing Old Testament, New Testament, done? There's more to it than that. You need to understand who's Israel and, and who's the church. If you got saved under, under God's grace, you're the church. If you didn't know that, if you're questioning, am I Israel? Am I looking at a bloodline? That don't even matter anymore because there's no Jew, there's no Greek in the body of Christ. It says there's no free, no bond, no male, no female, right? Yeah. But a lot of people think that because there's been the creation of the church that that somehow did away with Israel. It didn't. That stuff's all still in effect. Yeah. Okay. Now, now that you got that, we can calm down. And not feed you so much meat. Chapter 16 is cool, but it's not nearly as, as buck wild as 15. Mom thought we were done. <laughs> All right. Sorry, y'all. Your labor is not vain in the Lord, y'all. What a blessing. Now Paul writes, Now concerning collection for the saints, chapter 16. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul wanted, basically, you know how churches will do a collection plate? Paul didn't want any collection plates ran when he got there. He's basically run your collection plate prior and sock it away somewhere, because I don't want any gatherings. He didn't want the church blamed ever. His ministry blamed ever. Oh, he's only in it for the money. You know, so he's basically saying, set all that before I even get there. He says, And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality under Jerusalem. Liberality is, is an act of generosity. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on your journey whithersoever I go for I will not see you now by the way but I trust to tarry a while with you tarry is like to stay for a bit if the Lord permit but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost for a great door and effectual is open unto me and there are many adversaries now if Timothy has come see that he may be with you without fear for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. 
Paul kind of blasts the Paulos there a little bit. I don't know what was going on with those guys, but uh, yeah, he's like, toss him under the bus real quick, and I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on with Paulos there, but they were definitely starting to have a disagreeing of will, and that's why I think it's important to have like one headship in a church so that you don't have differing wills at the same time and drama and craziness, you know? You can actually have some leadership. And he writes, uh, Watch ye stand fast in the faith. We covered what stand means. Be on your foundation, y'all. Quit you like men. That's one of those verses I remember reading it, and I'm like, I absolutely know I have to study my English language. I don't know it. Because quit you means to, like, give up, right? And I thought in the English language. And I'm like, that goes completely contrary to everything I think Paul taught me. So when I looked into it, it actually means the complete opposite. It's to perform something until the very end. See it through. Follow it through. Now it makes sense. Follow it through like men. You know, don't give up, basically. Don't quit, really. That blew my mind. And the only reason I was able to find that is because I slow down in my reading and I read in context. I knew Paul couldn't be telling you to just hey, give up, everybody. I'm like, well, that's definitely not what he's saying. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, you know house, the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Lord, I pray that you can addict us to your ministry, God. Yes. Boy, I've had about every addiction in this known yes. world except this one. This, I want to get addicted to this ministry, y'all. That ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Do you know there's nothing wrong with submitting yourselves unto men of God and people in the church? The church has a hard time submitting to anything for whatever reason. But Paul's writing that these people who have addicted themselves to the ministry, submit yourselves to them. So if you find, he also writes another part, you know, Mark them that walk so, talking like according to him. Because he says, my ways be in Christ. So mark the guys that are walking so and, and submit to them. So he's writing. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. Amen. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. He writes, the churches of Asia salute you. Kela and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, greet ye one another with a holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. And he didn't do that very often, guys. This was important. He wrote this one himself. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be Ananthema Marant Maranatha. And I looked into this word. It's only in the Bible once. And so I couldn't really, there's something called like the law of first mention where you can type something in, find out where the first time it's mentioned, and you can usually get your context. It's only in there once. I don't understand why it was left and it's not like why it wasn't translated, but I'm sure there, there's some kind of preaching and lesson to that. I didn't find it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We covered a lot today, guys. Do you have any questions before I wrap it up in prayer? Well, that's a blessing. Let's go to prayer. Amen, Lord. Thank you so much for a great message, God, and giving me some things to preach to the people. God, I just now ask that you give the increase, God. All I did is plant. All I did is water, Father, but you're the one who will give the increase. I ask you to prosper your word, God. If there be any issues with the, the audio, that you settle it, Father, and just help us have a a blessed week, God. We thank you for Drew being home, Lord. What a blessing it is to have him back, Father. And we just love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.